Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charlie Nicklin. I'm the Chief Executive of I Agree, and I'd like to thank you all for joining our July presentation. For today's lecture, I'd like to welcome Paul Harris, CEO and founder of Real Success, a consultancy that specialises in the people lifecycle needs of agribusinesses. Paul and his team help companies manage their staff effectively from recruitment through to retirement. And Paul is a regular speaker at various events on people development and staff management topics. For our lecture today, Paul will provide some practical tips on how businesses can stand out and become an employer of choice to enable both uh, to attract and retain people long term. As usual, our lectures in our lectures, everybody will be muted. And if you'd like to ask questions, please pop them in the chat at the bottom of the screen. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll unmute you so you can ask in person. OK, I'll hand over to Paul. Fantastic. Thank you, Charlie. And uh, thank you for asking me to run this short lecture this afternoon. It's a real privilege and pleasure to be able to speak to part of the industry, maybe that I don't speak to as often as, as, as I do in other parts of the industry. So uh, I'll explain briefly who I am uh, shortly. I'm going to have some slides to present. So uh, that will be the main background. You'll probably see me in one of the corners of the screens um, and as a backdrop, um, and that will take us through the, the, the presentation. But um, in terms of who I am, I say my name is Paul Harris. I'm the CEO and founder, as Charlie's just said, of a company called Real Success. And I'll explain briefly what we do when we get into the slides. But today's session is really going to focus on two key areas. How do we attract people to come and work in our businesses? Uh, and how do we, once we've got them, which is pretty tricky nowadays, how do we keep them? Uh, so it's recruitment and retention are the two uh, broad areas. Uh, if I start sharing my slides almost straight away, so you should all now be able to see my uh, my screen and also you'll hopefully be able to see me in the top left-hand corner or top right-hand corner of where you are. So recruitment and retention, that's the subject for uh, this afternoon's lecture. So briefly, who are real success? So for those that don't know who we are or haven't come across us in the industry, we primarily work what I call at the sharp end of uh, the agricultural sector. So we are really helping maybe even your clients if you're from the supply side of the industry. We work with farmers primarily uh, and we help them to, as it says on the screen here, recruit and then what we call engage, align and lead. So the four broad areas that my business helps with is first of all, the front end, which is how do we actually find people to come and work for our businesses? So I have a recruitment division. And then the central piece is how we engage and align our staff, which is really what we would call retention. Once we've got them, how do we get them engaged with our business and align to our business? And then the fourth sort of part of the business really is how do we help uh, leaders and managers and owners to, to lead and manage more effectively uh, in their businesses. So we have a training uh, part of what we do as well. But everything we do is centered around people. Uh, my background, just so that you know, for transparency, was not originally from farming. I live just south of Birmingham. If you've been to the Bull Ring in Birmingham, you'll know there's not many farms in that area. Um, so I never came across agriculture, which is another story for another day, perhaps, as to how we do start to, where, where do we recruit people from? Um, but I've been having my business now for 14 years, and 10 years of that have been primarily in agriculture, uh, where we are probably the only business that does the full people life cycle uh, approach, which is from the moment you need to recruit somebody, from the moment you need to develop and train them, to the moment that we need to maybe move people on, either through retirement, Retirement, which is a bit of a word that's not used that much, or actually the HR side and the employment law side of moving people on. But everything we do is centered around people. That's why we say. So, what we're going to cover in this lecture, I'll do a brief introduction. Then I'm going to talk about what I refer to as the 10 foundation stones. So, these are the things that, particularly in a farming business, but in any business, a supply side business as well, what do we need to have in place is the absolute basics to attract uh, people to work in our businesses. Then I'm going to cover what I, very briefly what I call the 12 step recruitment process. So for many businesses, recruitment is something that isn't tackled professionally. So we'll talk briefly about what I think the 12 steps to the recruitment are. And then in the sort of second half, I'll look at the what I call the six secrets. There are lots of them, but my top six secrets of how you can hold on to people once you've made all that effort <laughs> to recruit people into your business, how do we hold on to them? And then there'll be a, a, a point I'll make at the end about taking action. And that's the point at which we can open up to questions and people can ask me any question you like about how to, to manage and get the best out of your team. So why should we even be concerned about uh, recruitment and retention of staff? Well, a couple of stats here. 
it's really quite expensive to replace staff. Now you might go, well, yeah, absolutely. We know that that's pretty obvious. But actually there was some research done a little while ago as to how much does it actually cost to, re to replace somebody? What's the cost to a business? Now that's often not seen on a line on the profit and loss account, you know, loss of staff. It's a mixture of costs, but there was a survey done uh, some time ago now where 70% of people that were asked estimated it cost their business up to £15,000 every time somebody decided to leave. And that's what I call negative uh, staff turnover. There are good reasons why people leave, often for, for promotion, for a better job. It could be a different location, their partners moving jobs, all sorts of reasons. But when somebody's leaving and we didn't really want them to leave, once we've got them, we spent all that time investing in them, it's a big chunk of money just to write off if we can't hold on to those people. There were a smaller number of people that thought it cost anything up to 30,000 pounds. And depending on the level of person in your business, it could cost up to 30,000 pounds to replace them. Part of that, of course, is your recruitment costs, just paying a recruiter perhaps, but the lost management time, maybe the mistakes that occur as, as a result of somebody not being um, as qualified or skilled as the previous person, the training costs you've got to retrain people. These are costs really we want to try and avoid in our businesses if we possibly can. So we're going to look at, that's the reason really why this is an important subject. That's sort of the negative reasons. The positive reasons are, are of course, becoming an employer of choice. Then this problem begins to disappear because actually we're holding on to people for as long as we possibly can and as long as they're usefully uh, in our business and they want to be with us. But here's one of the questions, <clears throat> and these on the, on the screen here, you can see a tractor and a person. And if I was to ask you whether you're a farmer, whether you're an engineer, whether you're in the supply side of the business, when we think about purchasing a piece of machinery, so when a farmer is considering buying a tractor, do you think they would just dash into the showroom if it's a, uh, he wants to buy a tractor or make a quick call and say, someone send me a tractor? That sort of investment, I don't know, maybe anything from 80 to 200,000 pounds, depending if you're Jeremy Clarkson and you want to get the Lamborghini. So you will spend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of thought on that investment for a tractor, which let's, for the sake of simple mathematics, let's say it's 100,000 pounds. That's a significant investment. You might be leasing the tractor, you might be borrowing the money to, to purchase it, but you wouldn't just dive out and get the first tractor that you saw. If we think about people now and recruitment, and we just take one person in your team that you pay just over the minimum wage now for a 50 hour week on a farm, which is about 25,000 pounds a year. Let's say we pay one person 25,000 pounds a year and they stay with you, let's say 10 years. Wow, that'd be great, wouldn't it? 10 years. That's a quarter of a million pounds investment just in salary. So each individual person that we need to take into our business we have to see it as a similar level of investment that we do in our plant and machinery. But often we take the first person that comes along because we're desperate. So the first thing to think about when we're thinking about recruiting and retaining staff is we have to consider them as the same level of investment as we were if we were buying a new piece of kit. So what are the things that we need to put have to have in place before we almost start? recruiting. Now this is going to be very much um, angled towards that on-farm situation, but I'm going to illustrate as I go through these 10 foundation stones that they also apply to our own, uh, any business that's in the agricultural sector. They probably apply to every business everywhere, but uh, they, I'm going to obviously lean them towards the agricultural sector. So I call them the 10 foundation stones. They're the things that we need to build our business, our people strategy, particularly on. Um, so looking from a people perspective, not just a financial perspective or a, uh, a, a, a commercial perspective, what do we need to get in place to make sure we have the right things in place for our people? Here's the first one. So talking broadly now at the agricultural sector, if I ask the general public, how would they describe somebody who works in farming? The words that I often get asked, and you might be putting them in the chat, please do, would be grumpy, miserable. <laughs> always moaning. If it's not the weather which is wet today, it's too dry, it's too hot, it's too cold. So one of the things in terms of becoming an employer of choice is how do you speak about the people in your business? Do you constantly complain and moan about staff? 
can't get staff. They're all hopeless. Staff are hopeless. Rubbish. Word gets around. What I've noticed in the agricultural sector, it's quite, it's, it's very open. People meet in discussion groups and talk with each other regularly about their businesses. They're quite open. Uh, they often have in the dairy sector, particularly, they'll do a lot of discussion groups where they'll share costs and how things are doing. So how you talk about your people, word gets around. If you're in the supply side and you're moaning about your salespeople because they're not providing the results, people don't want to work with the business that moans about its people all the time. So your reputation starts with how you speak about your business and how we speak about our industry. We are often seen as the complainers and moaners. And actually what we've got is an amazing industry. It's an incredible industry full of science and technology and opportunity. But do you think the general public feel that? Possibly not. So step one is let's start talking about our industry positively. Let's promote it to people. Let's talk about it as if it's a great place to be rather than, oh, my goodness, do you not know how hard I have to work? You know, someone once said to me, yeah, but we work harder than anybody else. And let's take a let's take an average farmer that maybe let's take a dairy farmer that starts at half past four in the morning and is still working five, six o'clock at night. I refer to the person that gets on a train in Reading at six o'clock in the morning or half five, six o'clock in the morning to get a train into London, to get a tube across London full of stinky, sweaty people to start work at eight o'clock in the morning, leaves then at four or five o'clock in the evening to get a tube across London, to get a train back to Reading and arrives home at eight o'clock at night. We aren't the only people working hard. So let's talk positively about our industry. Foundation number one. Foundation number two is get social. You know, we are often in the agricultural sector. We don't promote ourselves well on on social media or on the Internet. You know, I often find that when people are looking for a job, the first place they will go to look for a job is on the Internet. They won't look at the local paper anymore because that's not how we particularly the generation. Anything below about 50 will go online. So if you're not online and I'm researching a, a job that I've seen, or I want to find a job. And when I find a bit of detail about a job and I want to do research about you, all I can find is my is your granddad's name in a directory 192 listing. Whereas the other farm I'm looking at, they've got a little website, they've got a Facebook page, they've got an Instagram page. We're more likely to be attracted to those people who are promoting their business online. Now, I know people get concerned, particularly if you're at the livestock end of farming, about animal rights activists and things like that. All I would say is they already know where we are. So do we fight back? Do we put positive images out there in social media about our industry or do we cower in the corner in fear of being discovered? Now, I know if you've experienced that, it's really awful and tough. But as an industry and particularly from a recruitment perspective, people need to be able to find out a little bit about you. So think about your what I call your online footprint. Are you, if you're not sure, by the way, ask the next generation down. They'll help you. Foundation number three, when we're trying to attract people into our into our businesses, is where and how we advertise. Again, the days of putting a little advert in the local post office may be applicable if you're looking for someone to work locally. But we have to get savvy with the way that we write adverts online. So whether it's using things like Farmers Weekly and Farmers Guardian, as you see here, or maybe it's the big job sites that we use, like Indeed, and using things on Facebook and Instagram these are the places now where often people will be looking for work um, on the, in the agricultural sector. There are lots of Facebook groups where you can place adverts uh, and get people um, asking, you know, asking for more details about the, the job. We tend to use Indeed as our place to host an advert, but then you can use social media to post and direct people to th those adverts. But we've got to get savvy. You've also got to be able to write a decent advert. You know, you've got to be able to sell the sizzle of your job. And if you want more information on that, give us a call. We have a simple format that we can give you to how to write a simple advert. But yeah, got to get savvy with the online uh, um, process. This one is particularly applicable to those who are on farm, but it's what I would call animal welfare. If we are a livestock farmer in particular, then yeah, you're trying to recruit somebody into your business and they turn up and the animals are walking through sheds with ankle deep in slurry, don't expect them to be excited about working for you. If you're a non-livestock farmer, it's just how you treat 
your machinery, how you treat your land. You know, it's, it's how we perceive you're treating the people that are in your business. That's often a key foundation to get right as well. Another area is, and I'll broaden this out uh, when we talk about retaining uh, staff as well, is the housing and the working facilities that we provide. If we provide housing to our staff, and particularly again at the livestock end or the at the agriculture, the farm on farm end, we often produce provide housing or mobile homes for people. If they look like this in the image here, don't expect people to be excited about coming to work, not only for you, but in our industry. It's a sort of a, it's a double edged sword accommodation. I know that it can be quite expensive, but if you've actually got it and it's available, it's a real asset to sell to people in terms of how they can, uh, how much they can earn and how much they don't have to pay in housing costs. If you provide a truck for somebody, make sure it doesn't look like this. You know, the idea being, if we're gonna provide those extra facilities for, for people, make sure they are in good working order. If you've got a house that you're providing, make sure the shower doesn't leak, whatever it might be. My simple phrase is, if you wouldn't expect your family to either live in it or use it, don't expect your staff to live in it or use it either. Which leads me on to even deeper, deeper dive. And this is particularly, again, for those that are running farms as opposed to those that are on the supply side. You know, the working conditions. So we've got the working facilities. That's the machinery that you provide. Is it broken? Is it always breaking down? Is it the housing? Is it the truck? Here we've got, they've got the working conditions of our farms. And actually, I was amazed when I did my first visit on a farm 10 years ago now. And I just asked if I could pop to the toilet. And when I asked where it was, the answer was anywhere you like. If we're going to attract people into the industry, we can't have toilets that look like this. We can't have, you know, provide some, some washing facilities for people, provide a decent staff room with, with, with not furniture that was on the way to the tip. If it's going to the tip, send it to the tip. And if you're not on farm, but you're working in an office environment, a decent staff room with decent facilities where they can sit and relax with a microwave that works and a kettle that doesn't blow up, all these are areas where when I'm coming for an interview, this is at the recruitment stage, let alone retention, I will be looking at those things. You know, if your staff room is poor and I go to another staff room in a different business or a different farm and it's better, these are the small things that candidates tell us are the things that swing whether they come and work for you or somebody else. So get our working conditions right. Working hours, there is a sort of a strange um, quite masculine approach to we work 100 hours a week and that's showing that we are committed to the industry if we're going to attract people into agriculture we need to address the fact that we are long working hours we have farm I, we have farming clients now who have their staff working five days a week 40 hours now they have more staff but their costs overall are about the same what they've got is a much higher yield, whether that's their crops or their or their milk, if they're a livestock farmer, dairy farmer, because actually people who are tired make mistakes. People who are exhausted have more time off through illness. So we have to address this one with working hours and finding ways to, to reduce the working hours. And if you're expecting people to work 10, 12, 15 hours a day, don't be surprised if they don't want to come and work on your farm or they're keen to get away somewhere else. And we have to be competitive with salaries, foundation number eight. It's not about being silly with salaries, and I'll talk later about money isn't always the most important motivator, but we've got to be competitive. Uh, but what I would say is if you are a live, uh, if you're a, a farmer and you're providing accommodation, don't forget to include that in your overall package. So somebody who's on £25,000 a year, relatively junior position on a farm, could actually be earning the equivalent of about 50000 if you take the tax, the taxable benefit element to providing people with accommodation. So our salaries are good. And if you are um, in the supply side again, just make sure you're competitive, but you don't have to be silly and overpay because that just creates a load of inflation. What's the first impression of your business? What's the first impression I get when I drive up to your farm or I come up to your offices, is the guttering falling off the roof? Is the rotting machinery scattered around on either side of the, of the farm? Bear in mind, we are looking to recruit people into the business that might be coming from outside of our industry. We will compare, people will make their mind up within the first 30 seconds, both of meeting you, but also meeting your business. So actually, if it looks a bit like this image, 
don't expect people to be diving towards you to work for you. And number 10 of my 10 foundation stones is what I call training and development. So this is really important for people who, when they're coming for an interview, they want to know how much you're going to invest in them in terms of training and development. And people often say to me, yes, but Paul, what's the point of me spending all this money on training people? And then they leave. I simply say this, what happens if we don't invest in training our people and they stay? Think about it for a minute. It means that everybody else has got the qualified trained staff and we've got the people who are untrained. Training and development is a key part, whatever your business is, whether it's on the supply side or on the uh, direct farm side, is understanding the importance of training and development. But there is one more thing, and which is what I call the mortar between the foundation stones. So what holds all this together? So in our exit interviews, when we ask people, what is the single biggest reason you might leave a business? I'm now moving from recruitment into sort of the retention side. What's the single biggest reason? And people often I ask that question. If you were able to answer to me in a live situation, you might say, money, I need more money. It could be working conditions. It could be poor housing. All those things that I've just given you as the 10 foundation stones. However, it isn't the single biggest reason people leave any business. The single biggest reason people leave a business is us. It's you. It's me. It's the, peop it's the people that lead our businesses. So if you are a manager or a leader watching this lecture back on record or live, we are the single biggest reason people will leave. So what I say is people don't leave businesses. They leave people. So our ability as leaders and managers to communicate effectively, to articulate what we're trying to achieve, and to do that in a style that works for the individuals within our teams is absolutely critical because you can put the right housing in place. You can pay people the right money. You can get the working hours correct. You can advertise effectively all those things. But when they meet you, you don't know how to communicate effectively with your staff. That can often be the reason that people either won't join you at interview stage or they leave you later on when they've worked for you for a while. So I hope that makes sense in terms of the 10 uh, foundation stones. What I would suggest you do if you're watching this on record in particular, wind it back and score yourself out of 10 on those 10, 10 foundation stones. You know, 10 being you're doing really well, three or four means you've got some work to do and you'll identify the key areas of those 10 foundation stones that maybe you need to work on in your business. So let's change tack slightly. So we've got our foundation stones in place. Now we need to go out and recruit somebody. So let's have a look at the recruitment process. Now, for many of us, when we need to recruit, we're desperate. So if I take the example of a farmer, and I'll come to the example of a non-farmer in a second, let's take the example of a farmer. Often we're desperate, someone's left. So what we do, we quickly throw an advert out onto Facebook maybe, or social media, or we put it somewhere, we tell people we're looking for, for somebody. Then what happens is somebody comes to see us and we show them round. We show them, jump into the Kubota or the Land Rover, we show them around the farm, we have a bit of a chat in the, in, the, in the van, we tell them all about what our farm is, and they seem like a nice person. They're vertical, they're breathing, they can speak English, and we offer them the job. And that is often the recruitment process that continues. Advert out, bring somebody in, show them around, have a chat, make them an offer. And then we wonder why later on that doesn't work out. So often if we recruit in haste, we can regret at our leisure. So in the go, going back to what I said previously in this lecture about the investment you're making in one person, just an average of £25,000 a year, bear in mind it's a £50,000 investment if you include the house and they stay with you for five years, 10 years, it's a half a million pound investment. These are huge investments. Is it not worth spending a little bit of time to think about what I need, who I need and how I'm going to go about it? So that's what our 12 step recruitment process is and this is the process that we at real success will use but we encourage our clients to use it too so how do we go about recruiting effectively i think this applies to whether you're a, a farming business or you're a farming supply business or even if you're a college or a lecturer how do we actually go out and recruit effectively the science behind recruitment if you like so the first thing is to establish what we call the staffing need when somebody leaves it's not always the case 
that you need to replace them with exactly the same person in exactly the same role. It could be an opportunity to shuffle things around, to move things around. So getting absolutely clear on what the staffing need is, is essential. There's actually just a little, little nod towards a pre-step before the staffing need. A good question to ask yourself is, why did the person leave? Why has this person left? Great to have an exit interview, if you can, to find out that information. But why it's critically important to find out why people have left is because the reason they've left might still be on the farm. In other words, if the reason people are leaving your farm is because they can't work with Fred or Mary or Bob or Annabelle, and Annabelle and Fred and Mary are all still there, your problem is going to continue. If they can't work with you, you might still be there. So we've got to establish, first of all, why we even need to find a member of staff in the first place. Once we have, let's get clear on what their job description is and what I call a person specification. So the job description is what they're going to do. And hopefully you've got written job descriptions. If you're working on farm, you can download free job descriptions from our website. But that tells people what it is you want the job to be about. The person specification is who is the person? What sort of skills do they need to have? What attributes, experience, qualifications they need to have? Getting clear on that is really important so that we know what we're looking for when we come to think about where we're going to advertise. So where are we going to advertise? Are we going to go online? Are we going to use Facebook? Are we going to use Indeed? Are we going to use our local newspaper? Are we going to tell our discussion groups? What's the strategy? Then, of course, we've got to write the advert. We've actually got to write the advert. So again, there's a simple way to do that, but don't be frightened to make sure you put enough detail in to explain to people what the job's about, where it's located, what you expect the person to be doing, what the role is, what the person will do, the, the, the benefits you'll bring and the location. Don't forget to talk about your location in your advert. Once you've done that, you'll start to get applications coming in, hopefully, and we need to have a review process for that, spending the time to actually look through people's CVs. And then you might get down to a little short list. We have an average of 100 people, roughly between 100 and 200 people applying for every job that we advertise. But clearly, you've got to screen those down. You'll, you'll dismiss huge quantities of those because they're not right. Then you'll maybe make some screening calls, which is an initial call to say, just tell me a bit more about who you are and what you do. And at that stage, you might then decide, oh, I've got a few people I want to interview. At this stage, we recommend and we encourage our clients to personality profile each of your potential interviewees, not the screen, not everybody you've screened, just the people you want to bring in. I haven't got time to talk in detail about profiling, although I will in a bit about communication. But in terms of understanding what makes somebody tick and how they fit into your team, that can be really important. It also enables you to get decent questions at interview, because if you're looking for somebody with a particular set of skills and their profile would suggest they may not have some of those skills, then you can ask about it at interview. Then you take a professional interview, not just the walk around the building, show them around the offices, have a quick chat, or show them around the farm in the Kaboto. It's actually having a professional interview. We recommend, by the way, that you allow at least an hour to an hour and a half for a decent interview. And the first three quarters of an hour to an hour of that is sitting in an office, in the farm kitchen, asking a series of questions. You can, again, you can download interview questions free from our website. We recommend you take up references. So if people can't give you a reference, that's normally a bit of a red flag for us. Take up references. And then we encourage, depending on the nature of your business, particularly if you're a farm, though, to bring people in for a trial, get them to come in for a day and show, the, show you what they can actually do. Maybe a day, a weekend, which you would obviously pay for if you wanted to. Then we can make the professional offer. And at that point, that's your offer of a contract with somebody. Uh, and then when they start to get on board, actually joining you, the recruitment process doesn't finish then. Then we talk about a professional onboarding process, which is not just, hi, Fred, good to see you. Go and talk to Bob, he'll show you around. It's actually a planned first couple of weeks of somebody joining you. If you follow those 12 steps, you're likely to have a slightly more, a slightly bigger chance, a greater chance of having a successful recruitment than, hi, how are you? I'm desperate, when can you start? here's the job. You're not likely to succeed long term with that approach as you are with these 12 steps. I hope that makes sense and shows you that that flow can give you a better chance of finding the right people for your business. So we've got our foundation stones in place. We've got a professional recruitment process in place where we're taking the time on each of those steps to make sure that we're giving ourselves the best chance of finding somebody. That will have taken time 
money and effort. So how do we now make sure that we keep our staff? Now, in the 10 minutes or so I've got left, it's difficult to cover all the areas of staff retention, the keys to staff retention. So here are the, my top six, the six, six things I think if you put them in place, you've got a better chance of holding on to the people, the good people, particularly in your business. So here are my six secrets to staff retention. The first one I've already mentioned here is learning to be able to communicate. We've already said the single biggest reason that people will leave any business is another person. It could be a colleague, but it's frequently the boss. It's frequently the manager or leader of the business. So we've got to learn as leaders and owners of businesses and managers of businesses to communicate effectively with our staff. Now, people often say, well, what is communication? Communication for me is broadly split into two different areas. It's, it's the, the, um, the situations that we communicate in, that's meetings and things like that. But most importantly, it's the style. Often people will say, I don't like the way the boss speaks to me. So for those of you that are not familiar with personality styles and profiling, this is the center of real success. Everything we do is predicated on firstly understanding yourself, how you think, and then that, how that translates into your behavior. And then how that comes out in the words that you say. There are many systems out there that can help you with this. Systems such as Myers-Briggs, DISC or Insights. There's others like Dove and uh, Luminous Bark. Lots of systems out there that are all based on similar psychology that fundamentally says we all have a different preference to how we like to think and then subsequently behave. And therefore, one size does not fit all. And the way that you prefer to be spoken to doesn't necessarily match with the way that your team want to be spoken to. You've heard the phrase, treat other people as you wish to be treated. It's quite a strong part of British culture. Treat other people as we wish to be treated. From a respect perspective, I totally agree. From a communication perspective, I completely disagree. We don't talk to other people in the way that I want to be spoken to. We talk to other people in the way that they wish to be spoken to. And that's a world of difference. Now, using different systems, you can learn about this. My system that I've developed purely for agriculture, so it's unique to real success, is a system called VITA, which stands for visionary, investigator, team maker, and adventurer. Four different groups of personality traits that we all possess, but we possess them in different levels. And through profiling, you can understand which of the four personality styles you and your team might be. What it enables us to do is to produce a report a bit like this. And again, other systems are available. Insights will give you a decent report and so will DISC. Um, Vita is a very brief system. It's meant to be designed for, for more about reading about other people than it is about you. But what you would get is a report like this, where it at least gives you an understanding, first of all, generically, what the four personality styles are about, and then what that person's particular mix is. That then helps you to understand how to communicate and talk and ask people to do things. So as an example, if you're a very high visionary, which is a very high read in insights, you tend to be more direct, blunt speaking, it's just about the result, let's crack on. If you're more of a, what I call an investigator, you're more likely to want to be spoken to with plenty of detail, time to think about it, a system, a plan, I need to understand exactly what it is we're trying to achieve and have protocols and systems in place. If I'm more of a team maker, I lead with team maker, I'm more likely to be interested in relationships and how people feel and being considerate and generous with my time and support. And I want you to ask me, not shout at me, please. If I'm an adventurer, which is the yellow in insights, then I'm more like to be more sociable and perhaps a bit more impulsive. And perhaps I might get bored easily, but I want you just to give me the overview. I don't want all the detail. Once you understand what your team is like, you can then get some sort of team report, which gives you the clues as to how I need to manage our staff more effectively. So you can see here that understanding communication and how to speak to people is absolutely fundamental to keeping people within your business. People will often tell us the reason they're leaving is simply the way the boss spoke to me. Number two, keep the team informed. This is another part of communication. People often say to me, communication on our business is really poor. We don't know what we're supposed to be doing. We don't know how we're doing. We don't know how we're performing. We don't know how the business is getting on. So actually just keeping the team informed 
is absolutely critical. So do the team know what you're trying to achieve? And we can talk about mission statements and vision statements and a set of values, but we might think that doesn't apply to my family farming business. It doesn't apply to my small supply business. Actually, it does. Staff want to know what it is we're trying to achieve. What are we trying to achieve as a farm? Is it, do we have a set of, of, of goals or targets that we're trying to hit? What are our values, which is how we want people to behave when they're working with us? If we don't tell people what we're trying to achieve or how we want you to behave, how can we criticize them when they're not doing it? And the way we can do that quite frequently is have regular staff meetings. A regular, if you're on a farm, that might be a morning briefing, but a regular meeting might be once a month when you sit down and we look at the, the figures and we say, how are we doing? Are we ahead of target? Are we behind target? If it's a farm, are our, are our cell counts dropping if we're a dairy farm? Are we hitting our yields? What might it be? Staff want to know how they're doing. So keeping the staff informed, having social events as well in the summer, if necessary, get people together for a barbecue. These are the sorts of things that really help. Even if it's just let's nip down the pub on a Friday night, if you're an office based business, these are the sorts of things that can really keep the team feeling they're part of a community. The third one is it's not always about the money. It's not always about money. So what I mean by that is what are the other areas of working for your business where you can add value from simple things like providing, you know, a healthcare, maybe it can be just time off. It can be allowing somebody to to go and see their child's school play. It can be making sure that you work the weekends out because someone likes to play rugby, whatever it is. It doesn't always have to be about the money. And generally speaking, from a retention perspective, when people start to complain about their money, it's normally the last thing is the final straw. Often it's how they're feeling. Are they feeling appreciated? Are they being thanked for what they do? If they're not getting that, suddenly money becomes an issue. What I say is when things are going well, major problems become minor. When things aren't going so well, minor problems become major. And that's when money starts to rear its head often because there's lots of little things I'm fed up about. And now I'm cross about my money as well. Number four, and I've touched on this already. It's 2023, not 1923. So whether you're an office based business or you have a distribution center or you're a farm or you're a university, the conditions that we ask people to work in are really important. So if you're on a farm and this is your working toilet, don't expect people to want to stay with you. Maybe it needs to look more like that. If we've got a poor staff room, maybe we can improve our staff room facilities. And if we're exhausting people and they're shattered, maybe we can just do some things to make people feel more valued, less working hours. We've got to recognize now we're in 2023 and it's different maybe to perhaps how when I started work 35 years ago, you know, the, the, the expectations now are different, but these are the sorts of things that will mean that people will stay with you rather than leave. Two more things before I close. Do you do an annual personal review? So you've got your regular staff meetings. You've got your regular conversations with staff. Are you sitting down once a year minimum for one hour to listen and talk to your staff? We do a facilitated review process, which means we come in and facilitate the review, which helps sometimes for people to be a bit more open and honest. But you must sit down at least once a year with a what used to be called an appraisal. I don't like the word appraisal because it means I'm going to praise you. It should be 360 degrees, which is a personal review of how things are going. I urge you to have at least once a year where you sit down with your staff and ask them for some feedback. And the last one to close is what I call the importance of alignment. So when people feel they're part of a team, <clears throat> excuse me, and we're all pulling in the same direction like we are in this rowing boat here, then that actually encourages people to stay because we all feel we're working towards similar goals. But what happens if the guy at the end of this boat is rowing in the opposite direction? It slows the boat down. So what do I mean by this and how do we create it? I'm going to give you what I call my magic formula for thinking about staff and assessing staff. This is my magic formula. S plus K plus A times A equals P. And for those that like algebra, the first three are in brackets. What does this mean? When we're, when we're considering the staff that we have, we have to think about what do they bring to the business? All our staff bring an element of skills. That's things they can do. They also bring an element of knowledge. What do they know? So that's things they can spot. 
they also bring with them their attitude. That's their willingness to be cheerful, pleasant, polite, respectful. But they also bring their willingness to do what we ask them to do. And if there's change that needs to come, their willingness to adapt that change. That's what I call alignment, which then equals their performance. The most important one and the multiply is how closely somebody is aligned to what you're trying to achieve. Let me give you some examples. Let me talk about this gentleman here. Let's call, and for the sake of argument, and if you're called Bob, forgive me, I'll call him Bob. Bob's been around the farm, my business, for quite a long time. So if I'm scoring him out of 10 on what he knows, his skills, absolutely. What this guy doesn't know, worked for 40 years in the industry, fantastic. And his, his knowledge is great. But what this person's worked for me for a long time, really helpful in terms of their knowledge and their skills. The challenge is with Bob, he's, as you can see from this picture, he's a bit angry at times and he's a bit rude. And a lot of people don't like working with Bob because he's a bit inappropriate at times in his language. And so I'm only scoring four out of 10 for his attitude because it's difficult and he's difficult to work with. But he's great at what he does in terms of skills and knowledge, but his attitude isn't so good. The challenge is though, Bob doesn't want to do anything different. And when somebody new comes and we try to get a change in the business, perhaps he bucks against it. So he's not aligned. That's the red flag, if you like. But if we were to do the mathematics, this is purely a way of illustrating it. Bob here would score 20 on the first three, multiplied by four, because that's his sense of alignment. That's what he does with his skills, knowledge and attitude. Give him a score of 80. Let's compare that with Mary over here. OK, so Mary isn't as experienced as Bob, only scores six out of 10 on what the, the skills and knowledge. They've done some work elsewhere. They bring some of that, but not as much as Bob. And th therefore, the knowledge isn't as good. The difference with Mary is she's bright, she's cheerful, she's positive, she's pleasant to be around. People like working with her. The real positive, though, is her sense of alignment which is actually, it's an eight out of 10. She's happy to do what we ask her to do. She's willing to flex. She's supportive of where we're trying to achieve. If you do the maths again, it's double. The potential, performance potential of that person because of their attitude and alignment is more valuable to my business than somebody who can do the skills and knowledge. The challenges with the agricultural sector, we get terrified about losing our bobs. And sometimes we have to, because if you don't lose your bob, you'll lose multiple Marys. So sometimes we have to face up to the importance of getting the team aligned. I hope that makes sense to everybody. So as I come to a close and I open for questions. So we've talked about the 10 foundation stones, those things you've got to get in place. First of all, I've outlined the 12 step recruitment process that you need to be thinking about and just six secrets of retention. But why have I put taking action? Because what I would encourage anybody who's listened to this today Anybody who's replaying it on recording is this definition of insanity that we attribute to Albert Einstein, who was supposed to be quite a clever chap. He said doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. So my challenge to you as I bring this to a close is what are you going to do differently to attract people onto your farm? And once you've got them and you've recruited professionally, how are you then going to keep them on your farm? If it's not working for you right now, you probably need to try something different. From our perspective at Real Success, we're here to help. You can get, again, you can download free resources, job descriptions, interview questions, right to work checklists on our resources page on our website. But I hope that's been helpful and interesting to people. I'll now open to questions and I'll stop sharing my screen. So I'll hand back to Sarah or Charlie Bospers. Great, thanks for that, Paul. Uh, yeah, it does, the old adage is recruit for attitude, train for skill. Absolutely. It's uh, nothing the new. Alignment, the alignment to... one's even just as important, isn't it? The alignment. Yes. Exactly. The alignment is where you see people who are um, what I call passive resistance. You know, yeah. the people that will just natter to other people and tell people not to follow what Charlie says or not to do what Dave's told you to do, because actually, you know, it's OK as it was. That's can be. Yeah, that's why I talked about alignment. I've worked in so many teams over the years where it takes it just takes one person it was an utter pain and it just affects the whole team turns yeah, yeah exactly mm -hmm. but i understand mm -hmm. it's difficult particularly when there's a skill shortage when we're worried about not being able to replace skills and knowledge we can often hold on to people for a long long time because we're scared and i think i understand that because yeah. recruitment's not mm -hmm. easy but as you've just said charlie sometimes one bad apple can poison the whole mm -hmm. room. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and at fifteen thousand pound a shot having to replace people 
you know, sometimes it can be more cost effective to re to uh, replace a bob with whatever that might entail than it is to keep replacing your yeah, stuff. Yeah, I've seen it so many times. Uh, the, a couple of questions from me uh, to start. Um, have you ever heard somebody not wanting to come into the industry because of its safety record? Because, you know, something that was something agriculture struggles with is is it's it's got an absolutely terrible safety record and it, it's something like 21 times worse than industry and yes last, last year it killed 32 people in england and wales and that's figures never changed for about the last five years it's appalling really i just wondered if, if you ever heard any negative because you never hear i never hear any negatives about no we do yeah. Uh, yeah we do so but not necessarily from where you think it might be so if you're doing like an open farm sunday or an open event and there's or something like a llama or something like that where you get a lot of students and younger people often it's the parents that ask that question you know but is it safe to work in agriculture so in terms of my 10 foundation stones when i talk about working conditions and i talk about machinery and things like that there's also an attitude towards health and safety that I think sometimes is quite lax in agriculture, particularly at the farm end. You know, just from the simple things about wearing a crash helmet when you're on a quad bike, mm. you know, you as the leader have to go first. So if you're getting into the telehandler and standing in it to fix a piece of guttering rather than taking sensible precautions or you're not putting your helmet on when you get on a quad bike, don't expect the team to do so. So I think there is a concern, Charlie, about the health and safety record. Uh, you know, often people will talk about, oh, it's lovely because we can have our kids around the farm. Mm -hmm. It's illegal to have people on the farm that are under 13. So this idea of we have, we bring up our family on the farm, you know, and it's the toddler that's killed by a tractor. Yeah. Actually, we've got to recognize change needs to come here. You know, if you have got young children, it's illegal for them to be on the farm under the age of 13 because of the risks. And yet sometimes we will allow children to be running across a yard when there's a tractor or a lorry delivering some speed coming down the lane, you know? So I think it is an issue, Charlie, you're right to point it mm. out. And we do need to be aware of that. Yeah. 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 It's that, you know, it's the image again, isn't it? The, it is. and, and my second question is, is completely different. Um, I deal a lot with the FE sector um, and they've got a major issue at the moment with attraction and retention of FE lecturing staff specifically for land-based nag engineering um i think a lot of it is largely driven by the salary that's on offer versus what you can earn in industry but i just wondered if you've had any experience in that sector in the in the land-based sort of lecturing staffing sector no so just to be to be absolutely honest and i always believe about being honest we don't recruit lecturers we our, our, the recruitment side of my business is very much at the sharp end of helping farmers Having said that, my younger brother is a lecturer at a university and it's not uh, agricultural based. It's not engineering based. It's it's to do with criminology. But all the people he speaks to, all the universities are struggling to get lecturers. Mm. I think at the moment to go into um, health or education are two very tricky areas to, to get into. So I think there is an issue with lecturers generally, Charlie. I don't think it's necessarily just the, the ag en engineering sector. And it is just a problem we've got about not, not being able to pay lecturers sufficiently well, combined with if the salaries are going up, as there was a report this morning today that the average salaries are going up considerably yeah. in, in the more commercial yeah, okay. sector, people are going to make that decision to go in the commercial sector. So. I don't get the impression it's any worse in the agricultural yeah. engineering sector than it is generally. I was talking to people who are doing livestock. Uh, they can't get people to talk about livestock either. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's a general problem in terms of attracting people in. I guess the it question is. we should ask is why? Is it just yeah. a salary? Or are we not, in my view, selling the sexiness of agriculture? You know, I, I think if you ask generally people who are not familiar with agriculture, about agriculture they're not aware of the engineering possibilities mm. they're not aware of the science and technology you know some of the, i mean i know now some of the tractors people are using and some of the people here are probably supplying i've got more technology than rockets had in the 1960s you know so if you're into science and technology or you're into into science in terms of biology crikey the careers you can have in our sector are fantastic mm. but i don't get the feeling that we're selling that as an industry no it's it, it's been recognised. I think that I think for a part of it, really, but certainly at the technician level, um, we have a situation now where we've probably got, you know, we've, we've got more people. We thought it was an image issue, but actually the issue we seem to be finding is that the, the colleges haven't got the capacity to process people. Mm -hmm. 
So they are they are the, the you know the problem at the moment is that there's enough people wanting to come into the industry. It's we can't get them through fast enough. You know. It, yeah, uh, which is a real shame because the industry desperately needs them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's a complex okay. solution. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, um, so the next question is from uh, Alan Plum. Alan, do you want to unmute? And... Hi, Alan. There we are. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I do apologise. I missed the uh, first 10 minutes. I was on an errand of mercy, but... Um, That's okay, Alan, don't worry. Yeah, I, I mean, firstly, uh, endorsing Charlie's question about the safety element, because that's my background. I spent my career with a health and safety executive investigating the when it goes wrong and trying to stop it happening. So, um, yeah, it's a major challenge changing the culture. Um, and and, and uh, the mention uh, in that discussion just now with Charlie about the one bad apple affecting the attitude, that very much goes for safety as well. You know, the, um, yes. the, the, the peer pressure element as well. And, and so the culture's got to change from top down and bottom up. Yes. Um, my question um, was, was a bit, well, a bit like Charlie's really initial one, looking from the other end of the telescope, you, you've dealt with it from the employer's end of it, as it were. Um, the hat I wear these days is secretary of the Douglas Bonford Trust, and we sponsor students, um, research, uh, award scholarships and so on. And um, I don't know whether you've got any comments on that, but in terms of preparing individuals for their future careers and interviews yeah. it's a slightly different angle um but equally important to get those last few letters in your last algebraic equation right certainly um you know the skills and knowledge I yeah think, go I, on. I think it's a really good point a really really good point and we're currently talking to a number of or starting to talk to a number of the agricultural colleges because i think this idea of preparing students for the world of work is really important and again i'm not close enough yet we're trying to get so if you know anybody we can talk to let us talk to them because a lot of the curriculum that the students are, are learning about when i talk to students is they're learning the technical side of farming oh. right they're learning whether it's engineering or whether it's actual the front end of farming what they're not learning is the fact that how to behave work and also we have a generational issue as well that this generation coming through now particularly if they experience covid missed out on a lot of what I call the social side of getting ready for work so they don't know what to expect so so yeah we, we I've done some work with some colleges where we've actually just talked to them about profiling and understanding that when they come out of the world of work that they're going to meet people who are different to them and that's okay because what happens is without that knowledge they arrive on farm or in a farming business when people are a little bit abrupt they're a little bit stressed for time and they think, I don't want to work here because I can't work with that sort of person. But if they understand why that person is like they are, and actually then they're better prepared. So I do think there's a piece missing at the moment, Alan, from how we're preparing our youngsters to get into the industry, because a lot of them end up just doing it for six months or whatever and going then and preferring to work in McDonald's because they can't mm. understand the pressures of, of farming and what it's like. So I think we do need to do that. Um, Definitely, we need to be doing more at college level to prepare students for the world of, of work because it's they're not. I'm seeing that a lot. Uh, and a lot of our clients are telling us that students just don't seem to be aware that, you know, they've got to work 40, 50, maybe 60 hours a week sometimes. You know, it's not going to be a, a and it might mean you're not potentially going to get your weekends off. You're going to have to work Ooh. weekends occasionally, you know, Ooh. but we can still sell that really positively. As well, I, 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 I take the point, and my follow-up is is perhaps addressed to Charlie as well. Um, the, the, when we interview students for scholarships, they all unanimous that process itself, just that interview, crystallising their thoughts, getting their character over facing challenging questions, is vital. And the institution does that at branch meetings when we have student presentations that sort of thing but yeah my question for charlie is, is is there a process that currently exists in terms of mentoring specifically student members but anybody in terms of preparing them for for that recruitment process charlie no not as not a, a formal process no i mean obviously a lot of it comes in through you know registration if somebody wanted to go and go towards you know eng tech registration as an example so they go through that but it's something we do quite a lot and i personally do quite a lot uh, with people because I'm you know absolutely open door 
with students if they ever want to talk and chat about things I'll, I'll happily chat with them openly and sort of share what I've what I've sort of been through over the years so yeah so it's not a formal thing but it's certainly something that we happily do and we do we do advertise the fact that we offer you know career guidance and support so it, it is there from our perspective. I think that is probably worth encouraging you know, perhaps in the yeah. student newsletter as well just to remind people even going to a, a, a local members um, mm. business factory you know if, no travel involved as it were as well yeah. but anyway no thank you yeah. anyway thanks think, for your yeah, time. again charlie if we can help with that at all you know in terms of this preparing you for the world of work from a from an interpersonal perspective rather than a skills perspective yeah. i'd be happy to talk to you about that and the one thing i'm trying to do at the moment is because it's a member people leave people not businesses <laughs> is yeah. the bit we're yeah. trying to get in in between colleges and farms particularly if they're working on a farm <laughs> is have the farm or the business somehow accredited in some way that this is a good employer. It's an employer of choice. Yeah, yeah. They are going to look after you. They're not going to expect you to work stupid hours. They are going to have a good health and safety record. You know, if I, if I was a parent and a student at college and I knew there was a, there was a place I could go to that had somehow been approved as a student approved sort of business, I think there's more we can do with this is what I'm saying. And we've got some ideas as to how we could potentially help that. I think at the higher level, um, sort of university level, there's a lot more, uh, you know, preparation done to prepare people. Yes, yes. And I think from what I see at the lower levels, the level two, level three qualifications, there isn't so. Yes. And I think we're very quick to give young people a hard time and call them snowflakes and all sorts. Yes, exactly. And this, this thing about the lack of social skills. And I just turn around and say, well, guess what? You probably need to start teaching them that because if they're Absolutely. not getting their parents. I support that completely. Can I address you, um, you know, William Fit Flitner's question? You know, yeah, well, yes, Will's ne uh, I'll, I'll come on to it. I was just going to say that, you know, we, we must start appreciating that some of these these young people haven't got these skills and we need to start teaching it. So absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Will, yeah. Totally. Will's question. Yeah. OK, Will, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you fine, Will. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating presentation. Thank you. It's really I've really, really identified with it. Um, what I, I've just. Um, I've just learned something about myself within it that essentially the reason I ended up at university uh, as a mature student was because I was so fed up of dealing with the bad apples in businesses, <laughs> normally the bosses. And, and why would you like to know that? Don't stop being inquisitive. Just get on, <laughs> son. You know, and it, this is agriculture all over the world. This is Australia, New Zealand, Germany, you know, um, uh, and England. And I just wondered, do you work with businesses a lot in that kind of capacity of, of helping to manage someone out of a business professionally because it was yes. something that's been spoken yeah. about in some of the engineering um businesses i've um i've come across and it's quite a, it's quite a holistic kind of process to, to enable that person to a better career somewhere else where they're more suited it's not seen as a bad apple it's like you're the you're you're a different colored apple if that makes sense yes. yeah so again this is a, a workshop in, its, in itself is you know the employment law side of it making sure you're staying compliant with employment law uh, and what we try and give as a brief answer to your question william is what I call commercial HR advice. So mm -hmm. there is legalities that you have to stay on the right side yeah. of. And then there's a then there's a level of managing risk. But the way that I think you can manage people out of the business, your bobs, if you like, out of your business, there are ways to do that. What I call respectfully, professionally and with integrity. So you don't have to make that person feel, as you say, they're a bad apple, even though, you know, they might be. The challenge is in all in a lot of those cases, not all, but a lot of them, they are people who've worked for you for a long time. And that's why they're still there. So people say, well, I can't afford to lose them. There are ways to do it. There are ways to have conversations called protected conversations, compromise agreements. You can do it. The important thing is to take advice. Don't just dive in and try and fire your bob there's a way to do that but i believe it can be done and absolutely we're helping people all the time sadly <laughs> with that process of how you do it and it depends on how long the person's work for you um what the behavioral issues are because they normally are purely behavioral if somebody can't do the job normally we move them on the challenge is when they can do the job but it's a behavioral issue that we've got a problem with people are often reticent to how do i deal with that how can I tell somebody they're talking inappropriately? They're using sexist language that you can no longer use in the place of work and they just don't face it. So, yes, we would help clients through that that process. Bill, cool. just sorry, just had another quick one on the end of that. I mean, have you ever, have you, are you aware of any times when this has sort of come up as a potential issue in a business where actually it can be resolved as well? Maybe through some 
the boss learning a bit more about themselves or whatever yeah, and yeah. increased training or that's a good point it, william yeah again this is a workshop in itself because it's slightly yeah, cool. simplistic responses i'm giving really yeah that's right. yeah because the reason that somebody could be a bad apple is could be because they're perceived as a bad apple by yeah. the boss who just doesn't like the way that they communicate so if the boss is just really really tough and very direct and blunt to high visionary and the person is constantly bursting into tears and has got lots of time off with stress it might actually be the way the boss has been handling them, not the fact that they are themselves mm -hmm. poor. So it's far more complex than I'm just illustrating here. The important thing is to understand, first of all, what the problem really is. And you're quite yep. right, William, unfortunately, six to eight times out of 10, the problem is actually the boss, not the employee. And they have to be trained how to manage, communicate, lead. You know, we don't really have a good track record in agriculture compared to a lot of other industries for training our managers and our leaders. And often, right. particularly if it's a family business, well, I just do what dad did and mum did and granddad did. And that seemed to work. So I'll just do it. And it doesn't work, as you say. Uh, you know, and then those are the ones that start calling the next generation snowflakes. And they, yeah. what, they don't want to work 100 hours a week. We used to work 100 hours a week. No, they don't. <laughs> Luxury. <laughs> and they're right. You know, we shouldn't be working 100 hours a week. So, you know, we've got to modernize our thinking as well as modernize our actions. Thank Great you very question, much. Though. Cracking. Brilliant, thank you. It's, it's 20 hours a macho thing, isn't it? How many hours you've worked, worked on a farm? It's a great, it's, it's crazy, really. <laughs> we had an example, Charlie. I know we've got to go shortly, but we did. We, we yeah. exhibited at Cereals last... No, was it before COVID? Lose track when COVID. We exhibited at Cereals. And we had a um, an A board outside with a competition saying, come and give us your business card, because we wanted to gather people's names, obviously, to go in the chance of winning a holiday. Because the whole point was, the message was, how can we help farmers get their lives back? The amount of people, mainly men, that walk past and went, I haven't got time for a holiday. That's for <laughs> wimps almost, you know? And you're thinking, is it any wonder we can't attract people into the industry if the if the sign of success is the amount of hours that you work? It isn't, is it? The sign of success mm -hmm. is having a holistic lifestyle where I've got yeah. a family life and a work life. And we've got I think a lot of people learned that during COVID as well, didn't they? They it's did, just, didn't they? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, one, one thing I learned a long time ago, Will, was you're better off with a vacancy than the wrong person. Yes. You soon learn Which that. Are. You're better off without a person than the wrong person. Without. Just to, so when you're certainly in the big corporate world, trying to get rid of a person is incredibly difficult. And it's generally done, generally done quite bluntly in private businesses, you know, involving sums of money and whatnot. But I can tell you a few stories about that, but not on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I better draw things to a close. Yep. So... Um, Thank you so much, Paul. Excellent presentation. Really interesting stuff. And, and thanks for taking the time out of your schedule to do that for us. It's much appreciated. Yeah. I'm sure everyone found it really interesting and very thought provoking. Um, and agriculture, as we all know, is, is quite an interesting sector to work in uh, compared to other industries. So It's a fascinating, amazing, wonderful, yes, positive yes. sector to yeah. work in. That's the message yeah. we've got to get out there. Yeah. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and I hope you will join us for our next lecture on the 15th of August, where we'll be joined by Paul Mabwaze from the Institute of Sustainability, Energy and Environment based in Illinois in the US. And the wow. lecture is going to be discussing the co-location of solar panels on farmland, but without affecting its crop production. And if you like me and not a fan of solar panels displacing productive arable land, then you should find it pretty interesting, I think. So all I have to say is thanks again for joining and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.